Chapter 4 Spiritual Warfare, Combat, and Kingdoms A Biblical Look at the Use of Force Spiritual Weapons There are several verses of Scripture which are misinterpreted and woven together in support of a doctrine of Christian pacifism. When these are properly interpreted, the doctrine unravels. A fundamental text adduced by pacifists says, We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. See also Ephesians 6, verse 12 and following. Such texts along with the Sermon on the Mount, have been stumbling blocks for Christian teachers like Herman Hoyt, co-founder of Grace Theological Seminary, who says, Physical violence is forbidden to believers as a method of accomplishing a purpose. It is not Christian. Calvin comments simply, The kind of weapons correspond to the kind of war. Gospel preaching is a kind of action which requires the power of God's Spirit to accomplish the salvation of the hearer. But that does not mean that Paul opposes the use of the physical rod on the rear ends of children, or the consumption of physical food for his physical body, or the use of a physical sword to ward off the attacks of physical animals. The point is simply that when Paul combats the forces of Satan as they attack him spiritually, he has a true spiritual weaponry for the offensive, as well as the defensive aspects of the spiritual warfare. Paul is, as Tasker says, quote, not at the mercy of the instincts of corrupt human nature, nor does he have to rely upon his own human resources. Quote, the warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against invisible and intangible spiritual forces which invade human nature and insinuate devilish thoughts into men's minds." Unquote. But this says, again, nothing about the physical battles he must also wage. The subject at hand is proclamation of the gospel and the defeating of philosophies and spiritual blockades to the gospel's advance. Verse 5. We employ physical means to fight physical battles and spiritual means to fight spiritual battles. And yes, even in the physical battles, we seek guidance from the Spirit of God so that we use our physical resources prudently and ethically. Did Moses and the Israelites not combine prayer and warfare? What is a better picture of this than the battle against Amalek over which Moses presided when his hands were held up in a signification of a prayerful dependence upon God. The army of God fought successfully. Exodus 17, verse 8 and following. Peter and the Servant's Ear When Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, Peter attempted to stop the enemies of the Lord. He chopped off the ear of one of the officers. All four Gospel accounts record the deed. Mark 14, Matthew 26, Luke 22, and John 18. Just prior to this point, Jesus had instructed his disciples to prepare for a change in their ministry. They were to take the normal supplies one would carry for traveling and survival, including swords. See Luke 22, 35-38. The fact that Jesus rebukes Peter for cutting off the ear of the servant, Malchus by name, according to John, leads the pacifist to conclude that Jesus opposed the use of the sword by the individual with the famous words, Put up your sword into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Matthew 26, 52. Hence, Hoyt says, If in Luke 22 Christ was urging the disciples to use physical force and self-defense, then he has certainly reversed himself, for he is now admonishing just the opposite. There is, of course, another view. Christ did not reverse himself or contradict biblical teaching on the godly use of force. Let us take a closer look at the records. John records nothing to the effect of taking up and dying by the sword, nor does he record the healing of Malchus' ear. 
He records only one rebuke from Christ. Put up the sword, the cup which the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? The point made by Jesus in correcting Peter, according to John's account, is simply that this arrest is part of the process leading to the conclusion of his ministry on the cross. The correction of Peter has no reference to the normal principle of self-defense. Luke records the healing, but no clear rebuke regarding the use of the sword. The meaning of the phrase, quote, suffer us thus far, 2251, is not clear. Enough, NAB, no more of this, RSV. Robertson comments as follows. If addressed to Peter and the other disciples, it means that they are to suffer this much violence against Jesus. This is probably the idea. If it is addressed to the crowd, it means that they are to excuse Peter for his rash act. What is clear is that Jesus wants to submit to the arrest. He prohibits the disciples from trying to stop the process. He then immediately rebukes not Peter, but the religious leaders for their patent cowardice for taking him under the cover of darkness. Mark, like John, does not even record the healing of the ear. If Jesus wanted to communicate peace and nonviolence, the healing of the ear would have been a paramount action to emphasize. Mark moves straight from the striking of the ear to the rebuke of the authorities for their cowardice. He then records Christ's words of triumph to the religious leaders. Every day I was with you, in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But this has happened, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Verse 41. Jesus is fully aware of the fact that he is fulfilling a mission which his disciples continually misunderstand. He is coming not to assume the throne of Herod, or even that of Augustus, as the zealots, and Peter, would like. He is already the king of kings. He has come for the purpose of offering himself as an atoning sacrifice for sin. See Psalm 22, 69, verse 20 and 21, Isaiah 53, Jeremiah 23, Zechariah 13, etc. That is his mission. It is Matthew who gives an account of Jesus' rebuke of Peter. That rebuke must be examined in light of three factors. Number one, the zealous impulsiveness of Peter, walking on the water, Matthew 14, 28, after having his feet washed by Jesus, wash all of me, John 13, 8, declaring his readiness to go to prison or die with Jesus, Luke 22, 30, 33. Number two, the political views of Peter, as possibly influenced by the zealot party, one of his fellow apostles was a zealot, see Luke 6.15. Number three, the general failure of the disciple to understand Christ's mission of atonement whenever he spoke of it. One example will illustrate. Immediately after Peter makes his great confession, the scripture says that Jesus began instructing the disciples concerning his destiny of suffering, death, and resurrection. In response, quote, Peter took him aside and began rebuking him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Christ replied, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Matthew 16, 23. It is a hard reply to what seems to be a genuine concern for a friend's welfare. But, of course, the Messiah was about to know the true concern in the heart of this frail and sinful man, Peter. He sees no need for the atonement because he sees no need to be saved from his sin. Peter is impetuous, he is rash, he is foolish, and he is sometimes faithless. He is not changed by the time they get to Gethsemane. When the officers come forward to arrest Jesus, Peter does not even wait for Jesus to answer the question yelled out to him as the officers approach. Shall we strike with the sword? Luke 22:49. He will jump to the defense of the Lord. And so he does and slices off Malchus' ear. He doesn't understand the purpose of Christ's death and how the role of the servant Messiah relates to the role of Messiah as king. 
the response of Christ is not summary judgment on the subject of the sword. His injunction against its use at that moment was no more permanent than was his charge that Peter was controlled by Satan in the previous instance. The aphorism employed by Christ, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, applies to this disciple who is failing to comprehend the truths that Jesus has been trying to teach. One cannot rely completely upon oneself for life. One cannot add a day to one's existence if the appointed time of death has arrived. All the things which one needs are supplied by God, and no one can supply himself those things apart from his benevolent hand. One who lives by the strength of his own hand alone shall die alone, and as Jesus has tailored the message in this instance, they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. In another situation, he might have said, he who trusts in his retirement shall have his retirement on this earth, or those who seek the praise of men on earth have their reward on earth, or those who lay up treasures on earth shall die with their treasures on earth. Possibly then, those who trust in the sword shall have it to trust in at the time of death. Within the whole of scripture, it is clear that our hope is to be found only in Christ. Any other hope will be to our eventual destruction. The rebuke of Peter then does not represent a contradiction in Jesus' former instruction on carrying swords for self-defense, nor does it establish a principle of pacifism or nonviolence. The rebuke is conditioned by Peter's rash and faithless behavior and the disciples' failure to grasp the atoning mission of Christ in fulfillment of prophecy. My kingdom is not of this world. John 18.36 We now look to one more popular text. The force of the Greek in this text indicates that Jesus is referring to the origins of his kingdom. His kingdom does not take its origin from this world. The nature of his kingdom is not the same. It was not originated for the same purpose or conducted on the same plan. Yes, he was a king, but his dominion was over the heart, subduing evil passions and corrupt desires, and bringing the soul to the love of peace and unity. Barnes. Were his kingdom of the same earthly origin as that of Rome, it would be unstable and changeable, since the fashion of this world passeth away, but since it is called heavenly, we are assured of its perpetuity. Thus, if the whole world were overthrown, our consciences will, if they are directed to Christ's kingdom, remain firm, not only amid shakings and convulsions, but even dreadful ruin and destruction. Calvin. The charge against Christ is insurrection. The fact is that Christ came as a king and sought at least to rule the hearts of men, which fact would surely lead to the toppling of godless earthly governments. But he was not an insurrectionist. His goal was not immediate installation of godly government over the ungodly. But to the extent that he desired the kingdom to come and the Father's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, he wanted it first to come to the hearts of men. Absolutely can it be said that in the long run he desires to extend his reign over all things. Psalm 2, 7-10 through 10. He is king of kings. His kingdom broke in upon kingdoms of the world at his first coming. It continues to spread through the hearts of men, Colossians 1.13, and under the reconciliation of, quote, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, Colossians 1.20. But Christ was facing a charge about immediate insurrection. Was he, as a king of sorts, laying claim to Caesar or Herod or Pilate's political office? Jesus was not plotting to lead an insurrection at that time. His kingdom was of another nature, with a different mode of operation. Yes, it has political configurations, it has legal, social, educational, and economic dimensions, but its mode of operation is first to extend dominion over the individual soul, then the family, the community, the polis, P-O-L-I-S, as in the city, the, sa the satrapy, the nation, the empire, 
the world. No, Pilate, it's a long-term thing you wouldn't understand. My kingdom is not of this world. It is a different kind. Jesus avoided detailed explanations for those who had no ears to hear. He spoke shrewdly when dealing with either those who meant him harm or those whose intentions were otherwise insincere. A particularly good example is his response to the chief priests and elders when they questioned him about the authority with which he operated. He answered the direct question with another question. I will ask you one thing too, which, if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? Matthew 21, 25. This shrewdly evasive but brilliant answer stopped the mouths of his malevolent inquisitors. It was not designed to enlighten all listeners, but to avoid a malicious blasphemy charge. The fumbling miscreants consorted together. According to the text, they began reasoning among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for they all hold John to be a prophet. Matthew 21, 25, 26. Jesus does not give them the benefit of the doubt and clarify his authority to them. Their intentions were transparent. He need not be. And so comes the reply, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 27. The rhetorical and sometimes oblique replies of Christ while being interrogated by false religious leaders and blind civil rulers do not make for good doctrinal proof texts. Calvin has a few comments on this passage. But it is asked at this point whether it is lawful to defend Christ's kingdom by arms. For when princes are commanded to kiss the Son of God, not only are they enjoined to submit to his authority in their private position, but also to use all the power they possess in defending the church and maintaining godliness. I reply, first, those who draw the conclusion that the teaching of the gospel and the pure worship of God should not be defended by arms are wrong and ignorant. For Christ argues only from the facts of the present case how frivolous were the calumnies of the Jews. Secondly, although godly kings defend Christ's kingdom by the sword, it is done differently from the way in which worldly kingdoms are defended. For Christ's kingdom, which is spiritual, must be founded on the teaching and the power of the Spirit. Yet this does not prevent princes from incidentally defending Christ's kingdom, partly by establishing external discipline and partly by lending their protection to the church against the ungodly. End quote. Christ avoids giving testimony which would give credence to the false charges of insurrection. He does this by deftly affirming his kingship while denying that he is calling the people to revolt against Rome. This does not mean, however, that he denies the proper place of revolution, warfare, or the godly use of force. Those who jump to the contrary conclusion from this text are, as Calvin put it, wrong and ignorant. In these first chapters, we have examined a basic biblical continuum regarding the unchanging character of God and his predilection for justice. We have also considered some of the flawed approaches to biblical interpretation. These have beleaguered efforts to understand what is right to do in response to abortion in America. Historic biblical interpretation does not radically demarcate the scriptures as have many ultra-dispensationalists. The consequence of their dispensational hermeneutics has been the neutralization of much of Scripture. We have also examined a primitivistic ecclesiology which views the ministries of the New Testament churches and the apostles as a final model for Christians. The consequence has been a view of Christian living which says, Jesus didn't do it, therefore I can't. The naivete of such an approach becomes apparent when it is pressed to its logical conclusion, no progress, no Sunday schools, no mission societies, no hospitals, no seminaries, no universities, no abolitionist societies, no democratic process, no involvement of Christians in politics, etc. 
Finally, we examine several passages upon which pacifists and advocates of, quote, nonviolence rest their cases. We have found the case for Christian pacifism wanting. The scriptures support the principle of godly force. The church has always defended the same. It is only the Anabaptists and other fringe groups which have denied the propriety of godly force in self-defense or the defense of others.